Yeah, yeah that's, that's right. right. <laughs> so, um, Dan, I forgot to do your bio prior to your presentation. I apologize for that. Um, Missouri is all you need. Okay. okay. I, I learned well from you back in 1973. So, um, Norm Mooney graduated from the University of Minnesota, College of Forestry, graduate student in 1877 with an MS degree in forest management and a BS in wildlife management. He was the Cass County Land Commissioner from 92 to 2009, where he directed, supervised, and monitored land department programs. Prior to that, Norm was a special assistant to the commissioner in 1991, forest resource manager, Beltrami County Land Department, County Coordinator and Wildlife Game Forester, Beltrami County, and Natural Resource Planner, Northern States Power Company from 77 to 1980. Norm has authored or co-authored numerous publications on wildlife browse studies, aerial photography, forest land improvement, using herbicides, and forest inventory and mapping. With that, Norm, it's all yours. I get two. All right. Well, now we're going back to the era of the Luddite because I won't have anything on the screen. But I do have a few show and tell. Uh, when I first went into the woods as a forest wildlife manager in the early 1980s, uh, we would talk about forest management, but there really wasn't forest management then. What we did was timber sales because we really didn't have an inventory and there wasn't much of an inventory anywhere. Uh, timber sales were informal or section one, so the way it worked back then is loggers would come in, and these were all local loggers, lived in the county, and they would request a timber sale. Uh, some aspen, very little, mostly softwoods. They wanted pine spruce if they could get it. Uh, in fact, this was uh, the time when people talked about the 1990s softwood shortage. Uh, again, it's, we, we have to get worried here because we're going to be really short of softwood. Um, that was the belief at the time. Uh, so there were things going on. There was forest intensification funds made available for counties. The state had them. Uh, for conversion of cover types, like converting aspen hardwood to pine uh, or spruce, and there was quite a bit of that that was going on. It was quite expensive, uh, and it didn't work all that well. Um, but we were, we were worried about the softwood shortage. Uh, at the same time, we were worried about our old aspen stands. And there were shearing projects. Is there anybody here that remembers the aspen shearing? Yep, there's a few people here. Uh, some counties were doing it, state was doing it, to regenerate the aspen. Uh, it was a real concern. Uh, well, I should add, doing timber sales was fun because you had black and white aerial photography and you had a plat book and you went out and you looked for timber to set up. Uh, the informal sales were all stick scaled, which means it was kind of intensive in terms of labor. Uh, so it, it, was, it was an interesting way to manage timber, as, as it were. Uh, in the 1980s, the DNR and the county land departments got into a joint effort of doing uh, the phase two inventory on the county and state forest lands. In fact, uh, we did hire a group of folks that uh, were on our inventory crew. In fact, a couple of them are here uh, that were on the original inventory crew. And this was uh, pretty exciting. We we're actually going to be able to find out what we had and maybe start managing. Uh, this was at the same time that the board plants were being built, this oriented strand board. Uh, Norboard. Uh, there was this huge 
foreseen demand for Aspen. Uh, I'm going to show you an example. We got pretty excited when this came in. Uh, like somebody said, we don't do any of this ourselves. It's a group effort. Uh, I remember Kelly Brown and I, when the first maps came in, sent in by the DNR, the Resource Assessment Group, it looked like this. We took that into the back room and we started planning our timber harvest for the first time. Now we knew where the resource was. We could start planning for the future. Um, and it, w it was just terrific. Well, <clears throat> thanks to Dick and Greg back there, the inventory crew, uh, about this same time when we talk about, you know, there's lots of people out there that help, I was down for a, a meeting down in the cities and I stopped in at the College of Forestry just to say hi to a couple folks. Uh, one of them was Merle Meyer, and I don't know how many people remember him. He was a remote sensing professor. And Merle says, come on in, we got a visit. I said, all right. So I sat down and he said, Norm, what is it that you would really need in the forest? What could you use? And in terms of resource information, I said, Merle, the one thing we need now more than anything is to find out where all our Aspen is. And uh, <clears throat> we're getting the inventory done, but we need more precision because there's lots of types out there that are just a couple acres, five, six acres of Aspen, and you don't really pick them up on the black and white. Uh, and there's mixed types. And he said, good, we're gonna set up a project. And it was 35 millimeter color infrared photography. And uh, he had a grad student, Steve Opseth, and they started flying uh, an area in Beltrami County, and they would fly intermittently and try different things. And I still remember when the, the photos came in and they hit it square on. It was f peak of color, fall, color infrared, and Kelly Brown opened up the, the photos and went, oh my God, there it is. It was amazing what we were able to pick up and then we could start fine tuning our inventory and really start managing. Um, that went well and then uh, we thought we really had it. Well then the photos came in from spring, uh, early leaf out and God, there was another whole trove of information we didn't even know about. It was even better than what we got in the fall. Uh, and then there were some other things like some uh, color with the right, in the summer with the right filter combination, we could pick out every black ash area in the county. It just jumped right out at you. So then we really got going on our forest management. Uh, the stand maps and the data came just in time because the demand for Aspen was just overwhelming. Uh, it, was, it was incredible. Um, so the right technology came in at this time in terms of we had the data, but then also this is, of course, everybody here knows all, all about computers, but we didn't at the time. In came the IBM computers so we could start managing the data in mass and we could develop worst first list or the stands that are most in need of harvest to regenerate. So again, another technology that came in, uh, made things work really well, uh, but also uh, the timber auction replaced the section one sales. We, we couldn't manage doing section one sales anymore. Uh, we started and there was a lot of hesitancy and actually some of the loggers really didn't like it, but we went to the timber auction. That way you aren't forced like, okay, we're gonna go set up wood for Jack Kiln. Well, we knew what he liked, we knew what area you wanted to log, that sort of thing. So you're managing for the logger and it's probably not a good idea uh, to be doing that. 
So with the information we had now, we planned out our sales, we set up the timber sales, and we went out and we managed the forest and it sold at auction. And what we were looking at is how can we do the best job of both timber and wildlife management. And uh, it was fun times. Um, we also had the funding at that time to put in the road systems that we needed so we could get to the different resources that we wanted to get to. Um, so it worked out quite well. Uh, that was a huge change for those folks that were back then because when I started it was chainsaw and cable skitter. All of a sudden it's feller bunchers, grapple skitters, delimmers, processors. Uh, it changed everything. Um, one of the things I still hear about once in a while is the uh, allowable cut. We kind of moved away from that philosophy of an allowable cut and went to a managed harvest where we would manage acres instead of worrying about cords. Um, let's see. Just, oh. Uh, I don't know how many people remember this. Uh, with all this demand for aspen, uh, hybrid aspen. Anybody seen hybrid aspen? It kind of disappeared. Uh, it, did, it was kind of like the site conversion, quite expensive, and it didn't work out very well. I called it agroforestry. Uh, probably not a good thing to do. Take that effort and manage the resources that you have and uh, we thought we could do a little bit better that way. Uh, oh, better show you another show and tell. The, uh, the other thing that came in, which really changed things for resource managers in the field, was the GPS. Now our acreage was precise on our timber sales. And we went all, uh, You know, it used to be stick scale, then it, with the huge demand for Aspen, consumer scale came in and people were selling on consumer scale, lots of paperwork involved. Once the GPS was kicked in, um, we moved away from that very quickly and went to all area estimate or lump sum sales and got rid of the paperwork. And what was interesting to find out, because I was able to check cruise some of the resource managers, is how consistent we were with our cruising. We would be within a few cords of each other in our cruising. And once you had the acreage exact, it made it very pleasant to sell the timber on area estimate. Um, some of the major controversies uh, that we had, I was a member of the Forest Resource Council uh, when it first started. And our meeting used to consist of about the first 30 to 40 minutes was an argument over are we over harvesting or are we under harvesting. And this went on for quite a while till finally a few of us said we have to stop this. Uh, I think it was Dr. James Beer always said let the data tell the story. If the data, if you collect the data and you present it properly you don't need the narrative. So we requested that we actually collect the information from the Forest Service, the state, the counties, the tribes. What were their acres of cover types? What was the acreage? And then how many acres did they offer for sale of each of these cover types for the past year, calendar year, or however they wanted to do it for one year without resale? It had to be new sales that were offered. Resales didn't count. So it took a little while to get the information in. And uh, does anybody remember what we found out? The discussion was over. We were not over harvesting. Uh, I think there might have been one or two entities that were close to 2% or right around 2% harvest level. And I call it the 2% solution. If you aren't at 2% or above, uh, your timber's falling down. And there were some that were down around 1% and even lower on their harvest level. Uh, so that was, that was really interesting. Uh, and 
we kept collecting that data every year. In fact, there was one county that I think they could get the information back to us in less than an hour when requested. They always had the information of exactly what they had done. And it, it did change some things. Uh, then here was another one that was kind of interesting. Uh, does anybody remember the Aspen age class imbalance concern? We had that one also that came up. Well, we put in a request to Rose at Pro West, and we said, can you take our inventory and grow it backwards to 1950? And this was, this comes out of Larry Olson, if you remember Larry Olson, the first county wildlife forester in the state. He was saying, we got to look back at what was. Well, they grew it backwards, and this is what we got as a product. And what it shows is we will never see an Aspen age class imbalance greater than what there was in 1950, when almost everything was under age 30. Um, so that answered the question, took care of some issues. Um, I guess uh, picking up a little bit on the prairie, um, and this, this keys into what I've seen. Um, it was the Bedora fire back in the 70s. Um, the prairie chickens showed up. That big burn that took place in uh, Western Cass on the other side of the foothills, um, the prairie chickens came back. We actually have a prairie chicken management area that was out on the Ridge Road. Um, the prairie plants did really well there. Uh, we even had, when the biological survey came through, they found one of the uh, mammals that was unique to the prairie. Um, so I guess we started looking at that as maybe uh, when it comes to the major changes to the forest, we'll let the wind events and the fire events deal with that and we'll do the smaller events with our timber sales. Um, let's see. Um, I guess one of the major changes we've seen recently, and uh, this is the loss of the industrial forest lands, and it's something to think about. In Western Cass uh, and Hubbard, potlatch lands are now potatoes. Uh, which for some of us folks, that's probably not really a good, good way to be going. Um, that's, that's probably one of the scariest things is that we see site conversions to other uses. And I think the presentation we had earlier that talked about the wildlands or what is happening there uh, kind of is a little bit scary. Um, I was fortunate to be in Cass County uh, again, because it wasn't me, we had the most unbelievable county commissioners you could ever ask to work for. Uh, here's how it would go when I'd call up a county commissioner, uh, or the county commissioner would call me. This was, this was one of the really good ones. Uh, his name was Glenn Witham. He calls me and he says, Norm, apologize for bothering you. Okay, this is your boss. Apologize for bothering you. Here's the issue. He said, we have this individual that wants an easement across the county land, uh, and it's on a snowmobile trail for his property that he wants to sell. And he says, can we go visit with them? And I said, yes, we can. This was good. It was a lot of fun. Uh, we went out and we visited with the landowner and his, uh, his real estate agent and he wanted to put an easement to his land. He had a beautiful deer camp on 40 acres, surrounded on three sides by county. And uh, I told Glenn we had done one of these earlier and it cost us a chunk of money to, to reroute our snowmobile trail. And I said, I have an idea. How about if we do an appraisal and offer to buy the parcel? And then what we'll do is we will deed enhance it that's called, some people call it restrictions, I call it deed enhancements. And then we'll turn around and we'll sell it. 
so that it doesn't impact our snowmobile trail, which was also our timber access road. And Glenn said, we've never done anything like that. I'll support it. We did the appraisal. We showed the landowner what we would pay. He said, you bet, I'd buy it. So went to the county board, Glenn made the motion. The other board members looked at Glenn and said, it's his area, yep, let's go try it. We bought it for 49,000. We deed enhanced it in where we delineated where the housing could be. It had a beautiful deer shack on it. The rest must stay in forestry. Uh, and access was by a snowmobile only during the snowmobile season. Because if it had gone with the cartway law, they would have had to come across the neighbor's land and that's what the landowner didn't want to do. He didn't want to upset the neighbor. So we, we purchased the land and oh, by the way, I did put my paycheck on the line. I said, if we lose more than this amount, it's out of my, my pocket. Because we're gonna try something new. Well, we put it up for sale. What did we sell it for? I think it was 54,000. Bought it for 49. So after that, the county board was really, yeah, this, this makes sense. You got a happy landowner. He was ecstatic when he bought it because he's surrounded by the county land. Uh, he liked the management plan we put on there. But what this led to, and uh, see where I'm going with this one, is uh, any time from that point forward where we had an opportunity to buy either an easement or buy a parcel, the county board was with us the whole way. They understood it. They got it. But then there was this other group uh, that showed up, and it was instigated by the DNR. It was called the Leech Lake Watershed. What an amazing group of people. Uh, they found out a little bit of what we were doing, and they showed up and said, okay, we're working with you. We're going to help you. And so they would show up with parcels on lakes that they really thought should be in public ownership. And uh, if it made sense, we'd go to the county board and the county board would say, yep, go do what you need to do. And we'd maybe buy a parcel and then we'd have a little parcel that didn't fit. We'd exchange with ourselves, sell the parcel that didn't fit so we could improve the forest resource and protect the waters. Um, can't say enough good things. There was, uh, Gary Lyle was in my office quite often, and uh, I was spending a lot of time on their projects, and they came in with one for Blackwater Lake, I think it was, and it was beautiful timber adjacent to other state lands and what have you. And I said, well, Gary, you have to get some real match money. And he and the other fellow uh, that was with him, Ted, in 24 hours, they came back and they showed me the check and they said, is that enough? And I said, oh crap, I gotta go to the board again. And the board of course said, whoa, that's the match money? Yeah, we'll go for that. But uh, the other thing that came out of that, and this is something that should be thought of statewide, um, is that the county decided they were gonna do a comprehensive plan and the citizens drove the comprehensive plan. Anybody that wanted to be involved could be involved. Leech Lake Watershed was heavily involved. Uh, our snowmobile people were heavily involved because they were very protective of their snowmobile trails. Um, and we came up with a pretty good comprehensive plan. And out of that came a board resolution. No net loss of public land. It was just amazing, it was a lot of fun. Uh, in fact, we're living pretty close to one of the main drivers of that, it was a county commissioner named Jim Demjan. He was very, very protective of the, the public lands. In fact, when we, uh, we did get rid of some Lakeshore lease lots that were in his district, and he says, that's fine. Just make sure you replace every acre in my district that you, <laughs> that you have sold. So it worked out quite well. Um, Just a, a thought, um, because I know some things that are gonna come up later, and there's a, there's a writer by the name of Willa Cather, and she says there's only a few human stories and they just keep 
re-rating themselves and uh, what's going on with the forest and with harvest levels uh, it'll always become an issue of, of over harvest under harvest what should we harvest uh, but you get everybody as Demjan said get everybody around one table and make them talk it through so that they get things right um, I think again uh, this is this is just a, a shot uh, I'm associated with deep portage and I like to tell people it's the most heavily harvested forest management unit in the state and I think they still are they're about 100 acres a year 2% at least 2% of the forest land base there is harvested but it also has an area of no harvest so you have the comparison within there and uh, Jerry Nemi who was very instrumental in the, the uh, Forest Resource Council on the guidelines for harvest, he was questioning some of the guidelines because some of them were more what we think or believe and not what we really know. Uh, he worked with the, the uh, Cass County Land Department and Deep Portage and they did have, have been doing surveys in there on the birds because that was his interest. And uh, you can go on the website and look at that research and it was really fascinating. Uh, all this harvesting in there that's done uh, the way it is done because it's wildlife specific uh, has resulted in some several species of birds of concern that are doing really well. Uh, take that next step. People always look for this one. It's a show and tell. Um, what do I think is going to be the future of forest management? Uh, this is one of them. One of the other things, Deep Portage is a fairly large facility. The building is a tenth of a mile long. Five years ago they went beyond net zero. And one of the primary reasons other than the solar uh, that's been done in the wind uh, is this right here. Anybody tell me which one of these can produce more heat, more BTUs. Usually people catch it right away. Yes. This in a wood gasification unit will produce the equivalent BTUs or more than this propane, even though it's supposedly the same. 6,052, I think it is, BTUs in a pound of wood, regardless of the species. And we've been able to test that uh, and it doesn't make any difference if it's aspen or bur oak. A pound is a pound is a pound, and you can get the heat out of it. Uh, I see that as one of the futures, and I can't believe we don't have a pellet plant in Minnesota yet, but maybe someday. Uh, it saved deep portage going to the wood gasification. We're able to replace over 300 gallons of propane with a quart of wood. Uh, huge savings, uh, $30,000 a year in savings. That's pretty impressive and we hear the discussion and we talk about carbon and there's actually fossil carbon and there's ambient carbon I love prairies and I love forests because they can really store carbon but where they store the carbon is really in the root systems young forest nothing does better at capturing carbon than young forest um, and you can tell I've given this presentation a few times. It captures it really well, but once that tree is mature, it's not doing its job anymore. It starts releasing carbon, and this is an example. You start getting the heart rot, you start getting these other issues. Now, if you take this a little bit earlier and put it into a um, forest product, like a two by four, um, you know, ox board, something like that, that's a long-term sequestration of carbon, and it's the, um, you know, the ambient carbon. But if we burn it in our gas, are also the same thing. It sequesters fossil carbon. We aren't using the fossil carbon, we're using the ambient carbon, which doesn't add to that imbalance. Uh, and that's, that's been a plus. So I think energy is going to be one of the issues that we're going to look at in the future. Uh, I wasn't even aware of this until a few years ago. I did not realize 
folks knew about it. I didn't at the time. I know the Germans did it back in you know the Second World War, but I didn't realize it was happening now today. Uh, and this is, I think, a sappy product, but this is what they produce, and you can produce clothing. But imagine clothing without herbicides. Think of cotton, think of these other uh, sources that they use. What can the forest do for us? Uh, they can kind of save us from ourselves. Oh, by the way, that I got to give credit to the county administrator, Bob Yoakum. That was his famous line that he used to have in front of his desk, our public lands present, protect us from ourselves. So he was also a strong supporter. I think I'm gonna end it and let you get a little extra break time. But that's what I see in the future, protect those forest lands. Oh, I did forget one other thing. Maybe the most important product coming out of these forest lands is the clean water. I don't know if you've ever, if you ever have a chance to see a map that shows where all the aquifers that are impaired in the state and the surface waters that are impaired. Uh, thank God we live up here where the forest lands protect us from some of that because in some of these areas, uh, it doesn't do any good to drill a new well. Uh, you have to use reverse osmosis or you aren't gonna be drinking the water. It's just the way it is. All right. Yeah. You want a question? We do have a little extra time, so if anybody has any questions, go ahead. More yes. Your work with uh, forest utilization and, and energy and such. How would you contrast our efforts, successes, failures with the Canadians, let's say just north of Manitoba? I've worked in collaboration with the, with the Canadians in regard to cattail. And in, in, in my view, uh, they're ahead of us they're going to be positioned much better in the future than we are. That's just my observation. Is your, your thoughts? You have the correct observation. Uh, you've got to decide you're going to do it and make it work. When you start working with cattails, of course, that's not as a dense carbon fuel, but they know how to densify it. And that's the key. It must be a dense carbon fuel. Wood is a dense carbon fuel. Uh, it's fun. You run into, well, we aren't gonna be running into many more, but uh, World War II vets that were in Italy or Germany, and they would talk about the trucks and the big tractors that they ran on wood. Well, it was wood gasification, so it's not a new technology. And it's just getting the product the way you want it, make it work. Uh, these wood pellets are, they're great. It's cheaper. Uh, with the chunk wood, like we're doing it at Deep Portage, but most people don't want to do the work, uh, but we see it as a jobs issue. Uh, they want the automated pellet system where they just turn the dial. Um, but I can tell you how it works at, at, uh, at Deep Portage because I give the tours and I, I throw a chunk of wood in the gasser when I give the tour and I go, oh, wait a minute, my property taxes just went down. And people go, what? I said, well, for every $100 that the logger spends on the stumpage, because almost all of it comes off county administered trust land, $8 goes to the township, $17 goes to the school district, and $17 goes uh, to the general revenue fund. So by us burning ambient carbon, uh, we're doing that. Plus, it's really clean. There is no smoke. Um, but then you've created those jobs within the county. Uh, and then we do have some night burners that come in that love that night burning job because it takes about eight minutes to load the three units. And uh, then the rest of the time they can read if they want, but they're always sweeping up and doing something and checking on the buildings. So, um, and we're saving a lot of money. Um, at the same time. So you're creating the jobs, turning all your energy dollars around within the county. I, 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 I'm glad that the Canadians are getting it figured out. We just have to catch up, but there's so much disinformation out there on energy, but we don't need to burn any more fossil fuel. Norm, I know it's on a lot of people's minds. Give us your thoughts on the proposed
<laughs> I'm going to use Larry Olson's line when we just discussed this a few days ago, and he said, what the heck are they doing still talking cords and thousand board feet? It should be identified which acres you want to harvest and why you want to harvest them. And um, you're, you just chase your tail when you chase cords. Can't do it. But your acres, you can be right on and actually end up harvesting as much or more timber if you do it that way. And you harvest it where it should be harvested. If you've got a, let's say I was a wildlife manager. Oh, wait a minute. It's kind of forest wildlife manager. I start laying out my timber sales and I want to lay them out. We started doing it first five years and then they went to 10 years and it was great because the loggers would come in, some of the industry procurement foresters would come in and look at the maps to see what was going to be set up at any given time. That's really the way to do it. Saying that we're going to harvest all this out of one area, you know, of cords, that's not really a good way. You aren't, again, you aren't managing the forest then. You're just doing timber sales. And I'm a strong believer in forest management. And uh, we, had, we had some really uh, good times with loggers and with some of the industry foresters when we showed them what we were doing and why we were doing it. And we guaranteed them the acreage. We said, this is how many acres we're going to have. We didn't guarantee the cords because we're all area estimate. Uh, and what comes off, and that's another interesting thing when you sell it that way. The logger who does the best job of uh, marketing the different products and who does the best job of utilization, he wins. So it's a good way to sell wood. But yeah, manage the acres. I'd, I'd love to see the wildlife management areas and see how they've got their harvest scheduled because they have a rationale for it. This is why we're harvesting this here then, and this here then, and this here then. In fact, I think there's a, there's a forest resource manager up in Beltrami. Is his name DJ? Yeah. He's done that for a forest management unit. He's laid it out for how many years? 40 years. Now that's the way it should be done. In fact, uh, this is that thing. We had the resource managers take pictures on the landing of the wood that was being harvested when I was there. Everybody had a camera to see what was going on with that wood. And when you start harvesting the wood and you're too late getting there, then you have to think about what age that stand was and you better get there earlier. And it would be fun to see an inventory where the resource manager would put in the projected date of future harvest. Um, that would take care of it. And then you catch things earlier, and there's a reason for doing it the way you do it. The other one I didn't hit on hard enough was the, uh, what I see a lot of on private lands is they, they put in pine plantations, spruce plantations, and then they forgot about them. And you see a lot of that out there where they're just not managing the resource and they're losing a lot of growth and a lot of value. But connected to that, I'm gonna jump this is fun. Uh, we talk about growth as being, we're going to cut the pine at X years, 50, 60 years, or whatever. Uh, what we did was something different. We looked at the value of the growth. And I don't know if it's that way anymore, but the growth beyond 60 per year was much more valuable per year than prior to 60, because now you start getting into the poles, the pilings, and the large saw timber. So those are some of the things that people sitting around the table should discuss. Anything else? 